Welcome everyone. We'll just wait for everyone to join us. We've got a full house today. We're very excited. Brian, thank you so much for joining us from Cincinnati. How's, uh, how's the weather down there? Well, the weather is finally clearing up. I was just looking out, seeing if there were any snow piles left, and I think they're almost gone. So uh, I was so, thinking that it might still be a little gloomy after the Super Bowl, but hopefully. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> now that that is still we're, we're all recovering still. So it, it may be. Uh, but after 31 years with no Super Bowl or even playoff win, uh, the city's been pretty ecstatic. So. I was going to say, I mean, it's amazing just to end up in that in that very select pool and to be able to get a whole city to rally, especially during these times when we've all been cooped up and really need something to celebrate. So I'm sure I'm I'm hoping it uplifted the city of Cincinnati. It did. I was actually telling my wife, I said, you know, maybe you don't need a winter vacation when you actually have a good football team. So it's <laughs> it's now mid-February and it's not quite so far. Spring's not so far away. But when your team's out in November of last year, it's, it's a long winter. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Vinu Deshetti. I'm the event tech advocate here at EVA. I first of all, conference platform. And I'm joined today by my friend and partner in crime, Brian Monahan with Prestige AV. I've had the pleasure and it's an absolute pleasure when you get the chance to work with Brian and we've had that opportunity several times. And we've had such great experiences and learning experiences when it comes to AV production for in-person and also for hybrid events. So I'm glad that we're able to have you, Brian, welcome. Thanks, Vinu. It's uh, the feelings mutual. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I love that we've been able to be on this journey together over a long period of time and uh, just learn about the business together and share it with our uh, industry colleagues. And uh, I, I think the world is, is uh, well set up for us to share our insights now. So it's very exciting. Yeah, and it's um, it's ever changing. So I know you keep your finger on the pulse. So thank you for that. Before we get started, I just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, wanted to let you know a couple of housekeeping things. This session will be recorded. We'll make sure you get a copy of the recording as well as any of the slides and materials that we share with you today. We do have certifications. We prefer providers for CAE credits. So you will get your certificate of attendance um, either later today or first thing tomorrow. Uh, if you are looking for CMP credits, we are in the process of getting this session approved. So if uh, once that gets approved, we'll definitely make sure you know and upload that list to the Events Industry Council. Okay, enough of the housekeeping. Let's get uh, into all of the good de dirty details here, Brian. Now, hybrid means so many things to so many people. Uh, there's so many definitions out there, but before we jump into even the definitions of hybrid, let's just kind of see where um, everyone that's joining us today, we're going to pop up a poll. Uh, let us know about what your hybrid experience is. Have you had to plan one? Are you thinking about it? Or you've just never done it before and you're hoping to learn a few things today? Well, I got to tell you, whether you've been on this hybrid path or not, there are, there's always something to learn. I know Brian and I are always comparing <laughs> notes and trying to figure things out, even on, on site. So it's great to hear from you. Um, we'll start, keep continuing here. Um, while you guys take this poll, we'll make sure you, that we share it as well. So Brian, let's talk about hybrid. The last couple of years, it's been all over the place. People have different definitions. What's it mean to you? Well, first off, uh, I, I think people are looking for a definition of hybrid, and I don't believe that is the goal of the term. I believe that the, the definition should be what you are defining your event to be. So when I think of hybrid, I think what elements are we going to bring in from various event planning or event uh, strategy techniques? So do we want to bring in a virtual element? Do we want to bring an on-demand development? Uh, element into the event and then craft uh, a vision of what that event's going to look like from many different angles and define the experience. It's not that uh, hybrid is a definition. Hybrid is a type. It's something to be defined. And so I think it's important to get out of the idea that hybrid is actually a definition of an event type. It, it, you as an event planner, event professional, it's your job to dig in and find all those aspects and, and make that definition right for you. 
Right. Oh, and I forgot to mention, we have Alexa Smith, who's our virtual tech producer today, joining us. Thanks, Alexis, for keeping us on task and keeping our technology running here. Alexis, if you don't mind, let's share the poll results with everyone. Uh, and it looks like, you know, you guys have, um, you definitely have dipped your toes in the water. So that's great. We would love to hear from you. As Brian said, there's just no one way to do it. So definitely use the chat um, to share your own experiences or if you agree or disagree. We, we're all wearing our big pants today, so we can take it. And it's all about learning, right? This is one of the reasons I love doing these webinars and bringing guests like Brian here so that we can share that information. Um, so Brian, why don't we jump in? Oh, as well as sharing your own thoughts and opinions if you have questions. Definitely feel free to put those in the chat. I'll try to catch them as we go along or with using the Q&A function. So um, forgot about that little housekeeping, but okay. So Brian, let's jump into the definitions or not the definition, the different types of hybrid events. Um, we actually have some slides to help kind of uh, show us um, some of these different things. Alexis, if you can pop those up. Why don't you start us off with what, I, I love this term that you uh, shared with me, hybrid light. What does that, what does that entail? Yeah, I, I think just like any other hybrid definition, there's probably four or five classes, but uh, the easiest version of this is just streaming some content out in a very basic way. So that might be uh, through your Teams or internal Zoom uh, environments, uh, maybe to Facebook Live, but the goal is that you're just basically sharing the information out. You're not doing much uh, two-way communication. You might be able to communicate via some chat, things like that. But for the most part, you have a live event. You're pushing that content out to, to an external group that is kind of uh, separated from you. They're not necessarily going to be talking back. And so I think that's the key uh, to a hybrid light uh, type scenario. And that seems like the very simplistic kind of what we've always kind of been doing anyway, even before the pandemic, when people wanted to stream out or even record and shoot it into another room. This seems like it's pretty simplistic. What about the next one here? Now, I love this term. It's a, I heard this term not too long ago, simulize. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about it because I have a hard time with that. Um, I've heard more semi-live, um, but want to uh, um, want to respect what people want to call it. Um, but no matter what the term is, this is a, a different type. That can you talk to us a little bit about this one? Yeah, just like the other one, there's a lot of different classes. But I think uh, this this kind of lends itself for an asynchronous environment. Uh, what might be a little different about this than some of the other asynchronous uh, or on-demand type environments is that most likely you're gonna push the content maybe at a certain time. So it may be pre-recorded content, but at 9 a.m. I'm gonna start the video. A way to really opportunize on that and make it impactful is to actually bring maybe the presenter or the panelists into a chat so that they can interact with the audience or the constituents. And so that really is a, a nice format because what's nice is like, hey, I'm presenting right now. I can definitely go to the chat and monitor questions, but I'm trying to be focused on what we're talking about or sharing my content. So when that presenter is free to listen, they have much better uh, ability to talk with the audience. And I think that's a very viable option for a lot of events. Uh, one way I've seen this uh, is instead of trying to bring everybody together at one time, I have conferences that are gonna bring small groups of people together. They're gonna to do a live in person. They're gonna capture it on video. And then a week later, they're gonna actually create an on-demand environment, invite the in-person people back to that next event the following week. And so it's a much more powerful than trying to put all the resources together to try to mesh an external hybrid audience. And so uh, just some different ideas for you to, to look at this differently. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, and you know what, I've, I've seen a lot of scientific um, and medical type associations use this um, because of the content that they're doing in real time, right? Everyone's got to take it away, think about it, process it, and it gives them that time to come back at a later date and time to then discuss further or answer questions and really 
think about that engagement. This piece actually really excites me. Um, when we first started doing uh, virtual and we were asked to do a lot of the pre-records, I think the thought was, oh, let me do pre-records so my my speakers, if they have trouble on the day of, we don't have to worry about them going live. You know, we've got content to stream. But I love how you explained it. It's much more than that. It's about the interaction, the engagement that's happening real time. Let's talk about the next one. I like this, this is your term again, the Netflix style. I think that's something we all can relate to. Although I don't know that I wanna binge that much conference mm. content. <laughs> well, I've done a number of these and one, the way they did this one, I really enjoyed um, this particular uh, conference, but we did on-demand videos for certain groups of people that weren't gonna present live. And the idea was they wanted to reach out to a larger uh, group of attendees that wanted to present content that maybe they couldn't actually cover all the content during the, the confines of you know, a three-day conference or a two-day conference. So they said, hey, you want to provide content, you can pre-record it. They posted that content in advance so people could consume that as an, as an add-in to the conference. And so that really worked well. And then on the day of the conference, people are already energized about the event. They're already consuming content. And so then they had a traditional track with a general session, live streaming, and then we moved into concurrent sessions that were streaming as well. And so Netflix style could be an entire event that is 100% on demand, and you can add in those simulive functions where you bring presenters into chat, or it could be something that people come back to post event and comment and create an evergreen community. So a lot of different ways you can accomplish this, a lot of different value propositions with it as well. Yeah. And it's amazing to see where technology has come uh, since the beginning of the pandemic of just having these videos available to now being able to track who's watching these videos, do they qualify for the CEs and all that, which is really important. So that's, that's been a great feature that uh, a lot of companies have been able to do. Um, so let's go through the fourth, last fourth one. Again, this is not the last, last of all of the types, of course, um, but it's the two way. Yeah, so this is the, you know, this is the, uh, you know, the pinnacle. We all have been, you know, learning and we've all, uh, re you know, it's the Cadillac. It's we're going to bring every aspect. We're going to have a high production value in the general session. We're going to have concurrent sessions. We're going to have a virtual audience that can engage with people on site. And um, I'm going to be frank, it's a lot of work. And uh, I, I, my caveat here is if you're going all in two way, uh, you need to be committed. You really need to uh, make sure you take the time and diligence to understand what it means to connect a virtual audience with an in-person, if it even makes sense to connect them. I know you and I worked on the summer camp project over the summer, and we kind of created silos where virtual could connect with each other, in-person could, and we had a limited gathering of the two, two groups. And I think that's a good model for two-way because uh, I've been on site for a couple like reconnects last year. That was one of the first new hybrids. You and I are both involved in later this year in that. Um, but on site, it was really hard to pull out your phone when a human was in front of you and want to connect with a virtual audience. It, it didn't seem right or fair to the person in front of me. At the same time, I had a lot of friends out in the virtual that I wanted to say hello to. So um, yeah. I think it's Another tip in this is I would attend some hybrid events and, and get the attendee experience, present at events so that you have a, a sense of what all the different stakeholders are experiencing, not just a planner expense uh, yeah. viewpoint. Yeah, now that's interesting. Um, for Reconnect last year, um, I was actually, I had young ones and my young ones weren't vaccinated <laughs> yet. And so I wasn't quite ready to get out and about and, uh, and speak. So my co-panelists uh, were all live in person in Maryland, and I actually streamed in uh, and interacted that way, which was an interesting experience. And you're absolutely right. There is a lot to be learned from that. And actually, we actually have um, put some of those learnings into our own practice here at EVA. So let's do this. We've gone over some, um, some different types of hybrid. Uh, let's pop up our next poll. Um, and we want to talk about, and we want to hear from you guys, what, what kinds have you planned? Um, there we go. And we'll keep on going. We just want to kind of see where you are and we'll share the results of this as well. 
Now, Brian, let's, while well, everyone's taking this poll, I want to jump into um, the million dollar question in terms of like the RFP, right? Mm-hmm. No longer can you take your in person AV RFP that we all, you know, we all, it's a template, right? We all, we all do it and that's okay. Um, but going hybrid is very different and you can't really just copy and paste what you did in person. There's got to be some massaging. Now, as an AV guy, when you get an RFP, what are some of the things that you want in there? Well, I'm going to be a jerk right now. Okay. So uh, planners, your RFPs have not been that good pre-pandemic. Uh-oh, Man. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Ryan, that's kind of brutal. You know, we're, we've got the most stressful oh, job. And <laughs> give us a break. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. So, yes, there are a lot of details that the AV team is looking for. And so what I would say is a narrative RFP is, for the most part, useless. Okay. Uh, what, what I'm looking for when I receive an RFP is I want to see a spreadsheet. I want to see an agenda of sorts. And if you don't have 2022 ready, I want you to give me 2021 as an example. And I want to see things like room set. I want to see uh, room times. Uh, I want to see how the breakouts and uh, how the sessions transition. I want to know about your trade show floor. I want to know about all the elements. And so a lot of times as uh, uh, an AV professional, we don't, we don't all, we, we get this list of like, I'm trying to do an event for 200 people in a ballroom. What will you put in there? So. uh, That's even hard for an in-person event. That's not very fair. Yeah. So uh, one thing I recommend and, you know, it, I definitely believe that it's good to take a former quote, you cover up the pricing, uh, delete out any competitor information, but provide that context in a new quote. And so that still makes a difference for me as an AV provider, even in the hybrid, because it'll give me an idea about what you're accustomed to as an event, what type of uh, equipment you've been using in the past. And so that can help guide me to what best to recommend to uh, deliver a hybrid in the future. So I I wanna see that past equipment list uh, I want to see the transitions. I want to see some room diagrams, possibly. Uh, I, I basically want to see everything that you're going to be providing um, the hotel or the venue and so that we can interface with all that. That's the only way you can really get a good quote is um, because our dynamics matter too. If all your breakouts are in the morning, maybe I can bring in less crew. Uh, if your breakouts are all day, uh, if they're on different floors, you know, all those logistics make an impact. And at that point, when you get an R- initial RFP, because I'm, I'm sure at that point when an RFP is put together, the program's not completely finalized. You know, mm-hmm. we most planners, I think, have a general idea of how many speakers, how many tra- concurrent sessions and all of that. But how granular do you need an RFP to be to say, okay, I'm going to stream this piece out. I'm going to stream this speaker in. Like how granular does that need to be? Or can we just tell you, you know, we're thinking one or two rooms will be streaming out. We'll probably need to do two concurrent sessions that stream in. Um, And we're definitely doing virtual component with another platform. Like how much of that needs to be in there? Yes, I think you want to look at... uh you know, definitely defining the number of tracks that you're going to create in a hybrid scenario. Uh, I do have a lot of people that come to me and say, just quote as if we're going to uh, do every room virtual. And, you know, possibly in the past, they may have been even a organization that got a tripod screen and a projector and a podium mic or something like that. And and in the back of my mind, I'm like, you're going to be surprised how much this is going to cost because we're going to have, you know, each room becomes its own production. Uh, as you and I worked on the uh, Rest and Herd Meeting Planner Summer Camp together last year, and what was essentially a large breakout, uh, we I had to bring in a full, essentially, studio to be able to deliver on that. And so you think that that adds up for every breakout. So I think it's good to be Uh, strategic also to say, I think we have budget for streaming two tracks in the main sessions or the plenaries. I want to hear that kind of information as well. Right. Uh, Well, you brought up RHMP and that was a a great example of kind of a, um, 
bootstrap type of event where <laughs> we did a lot with little, um, but it was for maximum impact. And it was, it was a, the perfect combination for this type of group. So for all of you there, all of you out there that um, aren't familiar with RHMP summer camp, it's RHMP is the Russ and Herndon meeting planners group based here in Northern Virginia and it attracts local planners from the area. And there's usually a one day, um, all day educational session that we call summer camp. This last year we did it in the form of hybrid and we basically just had one big general session room and our hybrid version was that we were streaming out and we were streaming in and we had a virtual virtual breakout sessions and in-person breakout sessions and it was a nice little combination. If you're interested in learning more about what that combination is I can uh, definitely share uh, what that program looked like if you want some ideas. But it, I want to talk about a little bit more about equipment after all that's the, what this mm. whole session is about as well. Um, two types, right? Let's let's talk about that RHMP, very simple model um, where um, it was all self-contained. You did bring in a studio. Can you talk about some of the equipment that you brought for that? And maybe that's something um, some of the people here want to um want to be able to duplicate very easily if they're on, um, you know, their budgets are very restrictive. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we we went at it in a very, as you mentioned, bootstrapped uh, environment. So we were using a very basic screen in the room and using kind of like a traditional uh, mid-size breakout environment. Uh, I don't, I think we brought in a small sound system. So, all right, start with your base of equipment that you need for the room. Okay, so serve the room. Uh, that's how you want to focus on it. Do I need speakers, microphones, screens, lighting, things of that nature? And that's something you probably will need in most virtual environments is you are gonna wanna bring in lighting because you're gonna have cameras. Cameras need lights. So that's, that's an important thing to consider when you're going hybrid is uh, you now have a studio environment. So the next step is you have to create your, your tech table, your head table. And I, I like to think of that as a mini broadcast studio and uh, you're looking for, uh, the key there is to ask questions about the video switcher and ask uh, your AV team, what kind of video switcher are you bringing in and what are the capabilities? Will you be able to uh, assign uh, the video in the room out to the Zoom or conferencing app that you're using? Will you be able to ingest uh, remote presenters or uh, external attendees for questions bring them into your switcher and then uh, push that to the screen in the room. And so um, a lot of the switchers have come a long way. So in the past, that would have been, uh, you know, probably a hundred thousand dollar switcher to do that. Now, a lot of uh, there's these little small ones that have come a long way during the pandemic. And you might be able to get something that's in the rental rate of $500 a day, $700 a day, whereas in the past that might be a $3,000 a day rental. So there are a lot more options that are more affordable. So you wanna find out more about how, how they're switching that content. And that's gonna be something that's gonna be called a video switcher. Uh, sometimes that shows up. A very popular one that you might see is a Roland V60. If you want models out there, if you see that on there, that's a good little switcher that covers a lot. Uh, there's a something called an Atom Mini Pro. That's the real cheap one I was telling you about. You get a lot done with that. It's a really good little streaming switcher. Um, an HS410 is a Panasonic uh, studio style switcher, and that one is gives you a lot of capability. So you want to look for that. Um, I can put the the uh, switchers later in the chat, and uh, I'll get Vanu a list of all this, and she'll she can disseminate. Uh, some slides after the fact. Uh, in terms of, you want to look at cameras, okay? You know, so that's the next step. You're going to need cameras in the room. One thing we did fun at Rest and Herd Meeting Planners is I brought in the RoboCam, and uh, that was like- That was the, a lot of fun. It was the joy of the event on a lot of fronts. It, it, it was both entertaining for the virtual audience and for the uh, in-person audience because there was a lot of people in the room that we were putting on camera to be able to be put out to the, the virtual audience. And so a lot of people who weren't used to being on camera <laughs> found themselves up on the screen. And uh, it, was, it was fun because I was able to uh, swing that camera around really fast and have a bunch of presets and 
you know, bam, the person in the corner of the room was up on the screen. And so uh, it's, it's a something that's been around for a long time, but a lot of AV companies, I'll be honest, we've been arrogant. We like to have our camera operators in the room and our big production suites and all of that. But this RoboCam, it's fun. It, it, and uh, I recommend- allows you so much flexibility, right? That you can uh, be more interactive. You you don't have to worry about being stuck on a platform that was given no. to you by the hotel and you have to stand there. So, you know, it was definitely a great, great tool. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, honestly, if you get with a company that's got a, a system that they can put a couple RoboCams in the room, you can put one in the front so that you can get the audience facing forward and you put one in the back to catch the presenters and you can have a really nice event that's very interactive, makes the people at home feel like, oh, I saw the new in the audience. I saw so-and-so really creates a really nice uh, experience. Yeah, while we're on the subject of cameras, we do have a question that I want to um, ask here. Um, let's see here. It's, the question is about all-in-one streaming cameras, such as Logitech, Nevo. Are they gaining popularity? Um, I think, um, so I, we do not use them. There's nothing wrong with them. I, I would think that uh, they actually would be something that might be good for a breakout, to be quite honest. I, I've been considering that as an as a option for the company. Uh, a couple concerns with the Mevos is um, you, you're running a lot of the, um, the production suite over a network or whether it be wireless or, or cable oriented. So, you know, as an AV production company, I get a little nervous when, we're, when our controls are based in the web or the cloud. I like to have buttons and hardware. Uh, but for a breakout that's not mission critical, uh, I think that Mevo option might be a really good one. Something somewhat similar is the OWL cameras. I, we've been using them for board meetings, and you can actually take two of them uh, and gang them up together, and they actually will cover about a 40 by 40 U shape. And it's voice activated, it chases the people around there. So the OWL cameras are really powerful. And, um, you know, I, I see us using those for, for the uh, board meetings, small breakouts. Uh, so uh, webcams are getting better. You know, there's more you can do with a webcam. I'm still, uh, as an AV company, trying to, to get my head around whether it's good to put a webcam in the front of the room and use that as, as a possible feed of the presenter uh, as just a, an un, unmanned or unoperated camera. And I think that'll suffice for a lot of breakout worlds. Um, but uh, yeah. You know, it I, all kind of goes back to what kind of production level that you're looking for. If you're looking for a TV production, like you're watching a, you know, a major movie on television, then you probably want something more, um, more sophisticated, more expensive, and probably operated by someone um, that's more qualified for that. But if you're looking to do something more DIY or, um, something that you can, you know, maybe it is a board meeting um, that doesn't require that production level. I also think attendees um, have, through these two years, have gotten to a level of acceptance that conference programming is not television. It's real, yeah. things happen, people have animals crossing their computers, like, it's okay. You know, it's, it's part of being uh, human and being, being in real life. And there's, and it doesn't distract from what the content is. It's really the content that's more important. Uh, we got another question here. The question is, what role do different streaming protocols have on equipment used? Are most RTMP based? Well, I would say, um, I think RMTP is generally not necessarily camera based. It, it's gonna be how that uh, signal is getting pushed out over the internet. So. Uh, the camera would have to ingest into some kind of software or um, so the camera is not necessarily there are cameras that will hit RMT or I'm, I'm going to confuse the, the order on the RMTP. Uh, but um, I think that uh, camera wise, you want it, to, it's not going to be an issue on that front there. So I think that's more downstream of how you're getting that content out than it is necessarily camera based. Uh, generally, I would have a camera coming into a switcher and that switcher would be going into what would be a, some type of encoder. 
and that encoder is going to convert that signal to actually get into a computer or some other web appliance that's going to push that content either over an RMTP feed or uh, some kind of USB uh, camera input. Uh, that, that's how we would approach something like that. Yeah. Great. Well, before we go any further, I do I realize that we didn't share the results of the, the last mm -hmm. poll. Alexis, if you can share those with us. And it seems like you guys have been playing around with trying different types um, and have done, I think someone in the chat earlier talked about how they've tried a little bit of everything and we're planning a little bit of everything. So that's that's great. And I think this is, uh, it goes to that there is no one right way to do it. And you really have to figure out what's best for your attendees, what's best for your, um, your capacity, right? Um, and in terms of what you as, staff for an organization can handle and what kind of resources that you can tap into with your AV company. So let's talk a little bit about, well, before I go into staffing, Brian, any other equipment that you want to talk um, talk about? Yeah, let me look at my notes here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, you know, the key here is, I, I believe it's your your switcher is is one of your most important elements in the mix and then your encoding and how you're going about getting that that feed out to the web so whether you're using a hardware encoder software encoder if you're coming in via a usb uh, camera input uh, what kind of controls the the platform you're going to have so uh, that switcher and that encoder is the key uh, in my opinion uh, of a really good hybrid experience um, and then from there, you know, you're, you're getting into tra traditional AV type scenarios where you want to have some good lighting for the cameras, you want a proper sound system. Uh, audio boards can get a little bit challenging when you're doing hybrid. Uh, I'm sure uh, I, I want to go back to the polling question of how many people have done hybrid. And I'd like to say almost all of you have done hybrid. You just don't know it. Anytime you've had a conference with your colleagues at a conference table and you decide to bring somebody in on Zoom or Teams, and you start having feedback and you have to tell everybody to turn off their sound on their laptops, well, that's a hybrid meeting, just times an entire room of 200 or 500 people. So you've already done hybrid meetings. And so uh, you wanna make sure you have a good audio technician on, on the team as well. That's got a professional mixing console that can route the audio back into the stream without getting feedback and getting loops of audio and uh, create a really nice experience for, for both the in-person and the external. Are you ready to talk money? Let's talk money. <laughs> you want me to be a jerk twice on the call? <laughs> <laughs> you can do it nicely. Um, you know, what are we talking about? I mean, I know that's a loaded question without having an RFP in mm -hmm. front of you, but from doing something that is very simplistic DIY to get like, to get very simplistic equipment, like a webcam to doing something on the middle range, to the end range, give us that kind of range. What do you think that looks like? Or yeah. what are things that help us kind of figure out that price? No, I think, um, you know, I, I, on our previous call, I mentioned the term planner malpractice. And I think as planners and professionals, it's our job to understand uh, what the inputs of our event are. And I think, you know, I wanna put out the warning that if you have to shift hybrid, your event is gonna be more expensive. Your technology is gonna cost something, uh, whether that be platforms, equipment, labor, resources. So I think at minimum, I would plan on a 25% increase to go hybrid. And you could easily go double. Uh, you're you're essentially planning two events, and so uh, you know why would you have a second event that does not incur significant cost? Um, you know it, it seems cheap. You know you and I are communicating via probably our uh, our work PCs or what we use on a regular basis with some some nice little camera upgrades, whatever. Uh, that seems uh, fairly inexpensive, but when you scale that to a professional level, you need to bring in a, a different level of equipment to achieve success. Let's flip that question a little bit as well. You know, it's I think that's probably one of the biggest questions you get. How much is it going to cost me? What in terms of what can the planner tell you in terms of to help you 
answer that question other than what's in the RFP. It would would it help you to know how much they spent last time uh, or what their current budget is? Are there certain things that can help guide you answer that question? Yes, uh, you know, I think we're all in a new world and our time is also very limited. And I think the more you can be transparent with your partners, the better. So I think that budget helps craft focus and clarity. Uh, if you don't have the budget and you're wasting the time of somebody pulling together all the bells and whistles, you're, you're no closer to your goal. So I, I would find a way to offer, if you don't want to give the actual budget, offer a range or a target say how I'd like to spend X amount. Um, I don't think any, I've, I've found very few AV companies to be, or anybody even in the event industry that is looking to say, I just want to get all your money for the sake of getting it. Like we're, we're a service industry. So like your budget actually is a point of creativity for me. I want to give you a great event. I want to get you the bells and whistles. That's, we are professionals. We want to have a great event. So I think if you get more honest, more transparent, and say, this is my budget or my range, it allows me to get creative and say, how do we prioritize your resources? Is your general session most important? I've had events where the trade show is the most important part of the puzzle. And they said, my general session is not important. So why do we wanna put a big uh, rig in the general session when you want your sponsors communicating? And maybe that's having a platform that's got a really strong networking functionality so that you can match buyers and suppliers. And so I think it's important to understand what your goals of the event are, match it up to a budget. I wanna share another thing about that. I'm, I'm gonna just run right into it. So I think it's important to not consider this all cost. This is an investment, it's an opportunity. Uh, you can get sponsors for it. Uh, you can get uh, additional revenue streams, you know, on-demand content. Hey, we're, we're gonna go, go ahead and capture this virtual. We have a camera. It's going to the web. I'm using Zoom. I'm using some apl web appliance. Hit record. All right, now you have content. Put it up on Eva Reg. And now you have on-demand content you can sell. And now that is additional revenue, revenue stream. Also, not everybody's going to be able to fly in from uh, Australia, United Kingdom. You offer a virtual option. You may be able to get higher attendance. So Hybrid is not necessarily an expense and it's an investment. And right. So and I think you're right. I think we've gone through, and I'm hoping the time has passed, that planners have gone through this year one, year two of panic mode of, oh my gosh, my attendance is going to be low. I have to do something virtual, whether it's hybrid or completely virtual. And, you know, it, there's that panic mode. It, time is of the essence. Just got to do it. But now that we can really think about what's going to happen in the future, we've tried it, we've learned what's, you know, what's working for our attendees, what's worked for our organization in our own capacity of thinking what that future holds. And I agree with you completely that it is an investment. You have to start thinking about, you know, what are the goals that you're trying to achieve with the attendees and um, th that can be a whole nother session, Brian, <laughs> we can definitely talk about that. Let's move yeah. on to, um, Let's get back to a little bit about the RFPs and the, um, you know, in terms of when a planner should be approaching you. Should they should they wait till all the details are finalized? Do they wait a year out? When 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 do they pick up that call, phone or email you and say, "Hey, I need your help." You know, I think, you know, my hope is that we get back into some kind of annualized mindset. The world lives on a calendar year, and I think we have instead of panic the, mode. <laughs> uh, so if we can start to get back into an annualized mindset, I think that'd be good. I mean, we all kind of, we have birthdays, we live in that, that environment. So it's, it's nice to be able to put all the seasons of our natural life into event planning cycle. Uh, but I would say no less than six months to have a really high end two way event and, and do it well. Yes, we know we can do it in four weeks. We all did it in March of 2020 uh, or for the next six months, but uh, that you mentioned the future. And, and, and my hope is that I don't think you need to be in research mode anymore. I think you want to be in decision mode. There's enough information out there. The products have risen to a very high level because we are forced to do it at such an extreme level. The products are infinitely better than they ever were. Uh, I love, I, I often say this, I love Zoom. And we are able to come together so easily. 
people say they hate it. I it usually means that it's good because it's become the default. It's become the verb. And so uh, I think we're in a great spot for the future. I, I think events have been talked about this for the past 15 years. We want to go hybrid. We want to extend the audience. And everybody was too busy running their in-person events to actually work out the details. So we had to shut the world down. So us event planners had time to become virtual professionals. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, adding another ball that they have to juggle. And I think a lot of planners just rose to the occasion and got it done and learned and have shared a, a great new opportunity for organizations to really benefit from. Um, let's keep on the theme of timeline here. Um, so that's your timeline to start working with you. What about working with um, the actual virtual conference platform? If they're bringing in, a, they're going beyond Zoom and they're using a platform like ours or anyone else that that's out there, when does that conversation, when do you want to start talking to them? You know, I, like I said, I think you want to get back into that year time frame. I, I, I know a lot of us are like, that's never going to happen. I think uh, I like to see things happen in, uh, one year, six months, 90 days, 90 days, 60 days, you're in just absolute execution mode. Uh, a virtual platform and all the logistics of that, I think are very hairy in a 60 day window. Definitely can be done. Um, one thing I'd like to bring up, you and I talked on a previous call is it's important to align your vendors. Uh, you know, as an AV professional, if they're not the one bringing the virtual platform to the table, you wanna find, uh, the ability to have those services aligned and have them working together, uh, bring in the in-house so that we're, we're talking with um, them about the internet backbone. And then another one that I think a lot of people miss is corporate IT. Um, I've had a number of events where um, the virtual platform might've been using Vimeo as the streaming engine. And so, although uh, the IT for whatever reason decided they didn't want to have Vimeo on their, uh, network. And so if you don't know that in advance, uh, you may run into some issues. So I think it's important to have corporate IT. They also often need to raise bandwidth. If you're, if you're going to a single, a uh, lot of corporate conferences, and if people are dialing in from the home office, now you have 300 people hitting a virtual conference. I think it's important to make sure that IT organization knows what to expect. I also think it also depends all, you know, there's always that great first initial discussion that we have from the platform and talking with an AV provider of, okay, let's just figure out who's doing what, when, and where, and the details will come, but at least that initial kind of, you know, this is what we're working with. We're, we're either working with straw and going to bring, build a straw hut, or we're going to be working with brick and building a huge mansion. You know, at least we have that discussion of uh, scope and where we're heading. And then as the program becomes more fine tuned, where, you know, you know, you've got your run of shows for every room that you've got for every program, that's when the dirty work gets um, into play. But the more I know from a, from the virtual conference platform side, the more we know, the further in advance, the more helpful we can be to identify areas that can be trouble or problematic and say, hey, let's let's work this out and see, you know, how we're going to get two people in the same room at the same time, whether it's text or, you know, those little things. And, um, you know, Brian, what I've really enjoyed, not only with you, especially, you know, having worked with you um in person is most AV companies are like that. The texts are super helpful on site. So it's not only important to to have those discussions with the the account account representative, but the person that's actually going to be in that room on site and that that relationship of being able to troubleshoot in real time and really support each other, I think is a great way um, that just to kind of showcases how our industry works together anyway. Um, Let's talk about um, a little kind of go back to, um, well, actually, before we do that, you have some slides you would like to share with us. Why don't we jump to that? And then we have some questions that um, I'm waiting to the end for you guys. So I haven't forgotten about you, but uh, I do like hearing, um, I, I'm hearing, I like seeing this discussion you guys are having on chat about, you know, looking at is going virtual, going hybrid, dilute, going to dilute your in-person experience. That's kind of what we're all kind of trying to figure out right now. And, um, 
you know, where's that investment going? Or is, are you trying to attract more people in person versus it's all over the place. I think I would love to see uh, where, what all the data is going to tell us uh, in about a year from now to see how that trend goes. But that's going to change, right, with uh, what's happening with the pandemic. But even outside of the pandemic, you know, you've got budgets um, and travel restrictions and just what's happening in the world and people being more conscious about what their carbon footprint is. So it, it's definitely an interesting period. And I love seeing that conversation. So thank you all for sharing that. Yeah, there's some excellent uh, topics going on there. And we'll catch up with that at the end. Uh, Alexis tossed up this slide, Miss Details. And actually one of, uh, we, we've naturally kind of covered some of these here in our conversation. But one I think is the biggest miss is back channel communication. And so there's so much ease to being at a tech table. I know Vinu and I at that recent event, we were able to look at each other and do hand motions or we had on headsets. Or, or throw a muffin if you're not paying attention. <laughs> yeah, or, or bring you a coffee while you're, you're uh, dialed in. But uh, back channel communication is probably the least uh, focused on aspect of a virtual event and probably the most important. So there's lots of different apps, uh, Discord, WhatsApp, uh, different methods of that, but you want to come up with a unified communication system, different channels within that system so that maybe uh, presenters can speak uh, to moderators, moderators can connect to in-person and virtual moderators, but you really want to define that. That's going to be the success of your event because you don't have the ability. Uh, I always say in a live event, the planner can come to me and say, we're holding doors for 10 minutes. Uh, when you're online, you, you don't have quite that, uh, you don't have the, all that physical element. So you have to really have a good plan for it. I, I like that a lot. Uh, and, you know, and don't be afraid to share that with uh, beyond your team. You know, I know when we work with clients, I invite the executive director to be maybe not in, not in the channel that we're taking care of all the details and everything, but invite, um, executives, board members, to have a place that they can voice um, their concerns, what they're seeing. Um, that is truly helpful for our team because they can they see things that we aren't seeing. We're seeing the the technical end of it. And to to be able to see that and also to be able to give them a voice before they get frustrated, right? That's mm -hmm. a lot of um, just this is technology. Things happen, but things can be fixed. To and address. And if we could do that real time and give them that avenue, um, I, I'm really glad that you addressed that piece of it. Yeah, and in a similar fashion, the help desk is a back channel communication for the attendees. Uh, I know when we've done help desks, it, it, it's always interesting the challenges that come in. Oftentimes, I, I'll, I'll get ones like, hey, when am I getting my new laptop? <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's that's a different help desk. Uh, you might want to talk to your corporate <laughs> help desk, but uh, can I help you get on the session today or whatever? But uh, like, I think what's important, Vinu, you mentioned taking care of that problem fast. Uh, you know, when somebody stews, they can't get in the session for 20 minutes, they miss the first uh, part of the session and they finally get in and it was something simple. You're like, hey, did you check X or are you on the right page? Uh, that can go a long way to attendee success plan. Uh, also, your presenters, your sponsors. Oh, everyone. Yeah. Great. Uh, we, had a, we had a fun picture. I, I thought, uh, Alexis, could you go to that uh, schematic diagram? Um, you know, it's a little small here, but if you look on the left, uh, that was the schematic, which I wouldn't have ever even bothered to create for that event uh, in 2019. I'll be honest, I made that post hoc, but that's all I needed. I had uh, two computers into a switcher, into a projector, and the audio going into a mixer into the house sound. It was, a, it was a simple breakout. Same event, but bringing in the virtual audience. And you can see I have five, six laptops, two switchers. I have uh, in-person uh, projection. I have two cameras. And uh, by the way, this isn't even the whole uh, schematic because Venu was online with another computer or two computers moderating the virtual. We had another virtual stream coming into the video conference. So uh, I use a program 
you know, there's all different diagram. You can do this in uh, PowerPoint. You can do this in many, but uh, I use a program called Gliffy. It's really easy to create little diagrams. And I do this for my own peace of mind. I want to know how that content's getting from here to there. So I encourage you, even if you're not techie, to do some simple diagrams to identify kind of your ins and outs um, as an approach. It definitely makes it clear as to like this speaker is being zoomed out into the virtual world or this virtual audience is coming into the, the general session room and they're going to be on the screen or even like slides and all of that. It can, it can be very, um, it's a lot to take in just in this, I don't know, for me at least. All to get, just go in this head and not to be able to see it visually and be able to see it, see it like this. It's great that as a virtual conference platform that I can see it and I can and literally see that we're on the same page. No, I think I think it's important to document those ins and outs. It doesn't have to be necessarily a schematic. It could be just your quadrants. Alexis, actually, do you mind pulling up the Maslow slide for a moment real quick? All right, so uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a, a huge uh, kind of like underpinning of us in the event industry. We know at the bottom we need, you know, coffee and internet, and then we move up to uh, great education and then self-actualization. But uh, I like to look at a virtual event and kind of the way it looks on the, on the uh, right is that everybody's kind of got their own little Maslow's uh, pyramid you know, so you're virtual and I have to have a strong base, which would be my computer, my camera, my internet connection, the venue needs to have all of it. So I, I, I show this as a, when you start to look at your hybrid events, you want to look at them from all the different sides of, of the, uh, of the hexagon, so to speak here. And, and it, it gets narrow in the center where you need to connect all those diverse elements of your audience and your presenters. And that's, that's where the hard work is in a, at the center of that pyramid. But everybody's got their own Maslow's hierarchy of needs when you do a hybrid event. The venue does, the platform does, the presenters locally, the presenters remote. And so you wanna kind of look at that from all those different angles and find you know, basically a SWOT analysis against that. So I wanted to share that slide. As, as a model of thinking. So thank you for bringing back our uh, high school learning and yeah. applying it to real life, right? Now that's a great way to look at it because you do, you have to think about what everybody needs and address those before uh, you're too far into the process. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So we do have a couple of other uh, questions that I want to get to. Um, we've got about five more minutes in this session. So let's address these questions here. Um, Bailey is asking, are there any under 1K cameras you'd recommend? Yeah, I, I'd say that's a hard question uh, in terms of, um, you know, what the actual function is. But uh, somebody was bringing up mirrorless cameras. There's the Sony A7 series, which are kind of nice. Uh, the thing to know about various cameras you might get is you may need extra components. So if you're getting a webcam, you may be able to go directly into um, your computer or the uh, or straight to the internet. Uh, if you're doing something like a mirrorless camera, camera, DSLR, you're bringing in a professional broadcast camera, you're gonna need some way to convert that signal. And that's called a USB uh, encoder uh, is what you're typically looking for. Um, so you wanna make sure you have all the parts there. So yeah, the Sony A7s, things you wanna think about when you're going in down that mirrorless camera, as somebody mentioned, what kind of lens are you gonna have for that? Uh, those type of cameras don't always have great controls if uh, they're meant for a little bit more static use. So you might need to buy extra accessories where if you go with a traditional camcorder type environment, you might be able to get some of the, the controls for zoom and focus. Are, are not all manual and you don't need to bring in a lot of other uh, tools to, to use the camera. Right. Um, now, Brian, we we failed to show a couple of great slides that you um, had put together and we've addressed some of these, but I'd like to definitely show while everybody's here. Alexis, can you put up the slides about the RSP questions so they can see what they're gonna be getting here? 
Here's a, a list. Uh, I think we, we touched on all of these topics a little earlier in the session, but we'll make sure that you get this so you can kind of do a checklist of your own. And anything you want to comment before we wrap up here? I mean, in, in terms of the RFP questions, Brian? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously I, I mentioned the narrative. It's good to start with a nice narrative of your goals for your event, uh, but you want to move into the logistics, provide some past spreadsheets, uh, show some overview, show your room blocks. Uh, it, you may not think it matters to the AV company, but if I see you have sessions backed up to each other in salon A, or you have salon A turning to salon A, B, that does make a difference how I may approach it. So show me your room block. I want to know when I get access. Uh, with that, I would plan for more lead time on your events. Don't be getting the ballroom at midnight for 7 a.m. sessions. Try to get the ballroom the day before. It makes a big difference. Uh, you know, what, what are the venue rules? Uh, get your production guidelines in order. I generally have to reach out for that information that impacts price significantly. So if you can access that information, provide it with the RFP, that goes a long way. Also, so that the in-house AV company is not surprised when I call them and say, how much is rigging? How much is this? And they get defensive because they want to retain the business. Uh, make sure that the venue is aware of that. Uh, platform, do you want me to bring a platform? Do you have a platform? What's that going to be? If there is a platform already chosen, can I be connected with them? Uh, what kind of technology do you have as an organization? Some IT firms or, or some corporations have a lot of great technology available or IT teams available, and it's great to work with them. They've already gone through the same challenges. Maybe they've already done a lot of the due diligence in the background. So when I get an IT person on the phone, I'm always, we can talk tech and uh, get right to some issues right away. And they might say, last company, they failed, and this is why, and we can save a lot of hassle. And then I think it's fair to show up with a budget. Um, I, I, I really do. I think it's in your best interest. I think most companies, the company you're going to hire, by the way, is a company that's probably about giving you the best value for your dollar anyway. So they're not about necessarily getting all your money. They're about giving you the best value. So I would trust that you are smart enough to pick a company that's about to bring you value versus holding those cards because it's a big waste of time at the end of the day. I think the last slide that you had to share was a list of the equipment, which I think is, yeah, those are the different types there. The tech stack is interesting. We didn't talk about that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that piece? Yeah, that's kind of a, you know, it's a newer word for me. It's it's often been used in software or websites, you know, and and I'll be quite honest, the term was new to me when, when the pandemic started. Uh, somebody said, well, what's your tech stack? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> Welcome gotta, to the techie world. <laughs> yeah. And so what I've learned, you know, obviously we're building on a lot of different products now. So uh, maybe you're using Salesforce or your CRM, or you're using Eva Reg for your registration, uh, or you are using Swap Card for your virtual element, or um, I, my company has a Zoom enterprise account that we must use. Like I have some corporations, I must use uh, their WebEx platform. So what other softwares, technologies, softwares as a service are in your mix that we're gonna have to interface with? Uh, because it, uh, as an AV provider, it actually was funny through the pandemic, as they said, all these different organizations said, I never talked to an AV company my entire career. And now I talk to them every day. And, it, and so AV is really in the virtual aspect has to interface across all, all the space. So I think it's important to uh, make sure we know about all those different uh, softwares and elements that you have, have to, to integrate into your event. So Brian, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, we've got to wrap things up here. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Brian, before I let you go, this is, it's always fun to talk to you and it, time has gone by so quickly, but I do wanna hear one last thing from you. Uh, in terms of the future, you know, it's, um, what do you think is next? What, what are you most excited about that's coming up? Well, first off, I have been dreaming of this day for 10 years. I'm a technology guy. And so I love that we have gotten committed to putting on events in a high level way. And I think it's wonderful that we can connect. I'm in Cincinnati. I believe you're in Virginia right now. 
and we can do this easily. We can do it professionally. And so I think uh, I love the term Bizabo's using event OS. I think all these elements are going to become part of your phone, how you connect, how you uh, go to a meeting will all just be inherently part of your in infrastructure. And so you won't have to build it from scratch. It'll all be there. And our jobs will become more about designing the outcomes of the event versus developing the technologies for it. So. Well, thank you so much, Brian. And thank all of you who have stayed with us throughout this session. And like I said in the beginning, we'll make sure you get those uh, CAE attendance certificates, as well as once we get the CMPs approved, we'll let you know all about that. But we love hosting these webinars. We love having guests like Brian because they make it so much fun and easy to understand and really give us hope that it's possible and it can be fun. So we appreciate all of you. Appreciate you, Brian. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you see us next time. If you want have any other questions, we'll make sure we share everything with you guys. Um, but if you have any other questions, make sure you can contact Brian or myself. We're happy to spend some time with you to help you figure out what's in the future for you for your hybrid events. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have Thanks, a good day. Everybody.